Well, hi. Hello. Hello. Hi. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you here. Um, Joan, would you like to start talking about your work? I saw that it's like very related to a paradox. It's abstract paintings. Would you like to talk about it? Mm -hmm. um, I've always been interested in the public and the private, so this was a great opportunity to come and speak to all of you. And I've also been interested in an idea of artistic freedom and wondering if that idea actually exists or is it a forever ending quest that artists have and that perhaps freedom as we think it could be is not possible. Certainly freedom here in the United States is a concept and a way of life that's very different than other parts of the world now. But um, I'm also interested in history of artistic movements and their changing and their ideas of freedom. And I've done that in my work combining the present with other artists that were known. Uh, the last exhibition was a combination of media-generated images that I transferred in Mondrian, who talked about freedom as a pure abstraction, away from any kind of representation or political propaganda. And currently, I've moved away from him and moved into something even earlier, which would be Impressionism and their idea of freedom through a kind of scientific um, investigation of color. So that's what those are. I mean, they are analytical and they're also personal. Yes, because you talk about this accumulative information and also you mm -hmm. combine it with your personal experience. So I wonder how you can, or how the spectator can receive this information. Um, I, I accumulate information because I think that our private spaces or our private moments and minds are now really saturated with public uh, consumer driven information and that you know you wake up in the morning and you open the computer and it's your home page you know that's supposed to be personal but it's very much what some algorithm wants you to see and what advertisement comes because you were on some website yesterday and you realize slowly that you're really being inundated. I don't know if we're manipulated, but the ideas of taste and the ideas of the social are now very much in the private space or in the private sphere. And how much of that constitutes us as individuals is yet to be seen and what resistance artists can take or is there a resistance needed? There are some people that think that freedom in the West is much better than perhaps other places. So I'm questioning those through these investigations of materials and images. Yeah. I think that it, in somehow it is a little bit related with Natalie's work, mm -hmm. which is also about how the espectator can actually talk about themselves and express. I thought it was very intense when I was looking at it. And also like watching these responses from everyone and it, it has some kind of rhythm. Mm -hmm. Can you please talk about it? Yeah, I mean, when you were speaking, I was thinking, oh, OK, that makes sense that we're sitting next to each other. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Uh, I mean, the body of work that I'll talk about tonight is uh, work that I began in, um, in 2008, so a long time ago, but it, and that was uh, the year that the global recession began. And it was a, a couple years after Facebook had, you know, sort of really started to take off. Actually, Facebook had only been around a few years. YouTube had just been around for a few years. And I became really interested in, you know, sort of speaking of, actually, just to directly link it to what you were saying, in self-expression. Not my own self-expression, but in uh, the self-expression of, of, of ordinary people, okay? And, you know, sort of how much of that was shared. And so I, I uh, thought at the time that 
uh, video blogs, vlogs, were in some ways a kind of quintessential uh, sort of form of the moment. So today, really? I entered really a new phase sucked. in my life. I went into work. work. Like any other day. And my clock in card is missing. So, um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to my medications. medications. I'm on Depakote, 500 milligrams. I'm on Sir, Seroquel, what? 50 milligrams, once before bedtime. I'm taking G G on the extra Risperdal. Risperdal. So, so. 40 milligrams of Prozac. People were becoming, were revealing themselves in incredibly intimate ways and sharing personal feelings uh, you know, in front of, this was before mobile was really taking off, so in front of their laptops and their, uh, and their desktops, and they were, um, you know, sort of speaking in a way that is so innocent today, like this wouldn't happen in the same way today, but there's such an innocence and kind of belief in trust in strangers, you know, that people would talk about losing their jobs, as many people did at this time, and they would talk about you know, the medications they were on, and they would you know, sort of talk about as if people would care, you know, sort of what they thought about the latest political scandal. So I began collecting these and synchronizing and creating a kind of uh, Greek choruses or music. I mean, I very much edit to, you know, I think of music when I edit. Yeah. So I started uh, layering and creating a kind of synchron syn syn synchronic and, uh, harmonies and dissidences amongst the many to show the way that people intersected and there was an interconnection and then uh, you know kind of to show the way that that in a way uh, sort of movements and patterns of thoughts and ideas were traveling across the internet and while people were isolated and alone you know there was also a desire for and you know the kind of possibility of of, of shared sensibilities and ways of being in the world. So. Got it. Yeah, interesting. And the work was interesting. Okay. Really. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. This one, long story short, mm -hmm. this one was very shocking. And it's, they were speaking about their needs and how they feel uh, when they are very poor and what they feel when they don't have, like, this hygiene that they need. Right. How do you get them to talk about, like, such as personal... Well, I'm glad you brought that, that work up because most of the people who are enormously rich, you know, the Silicon Valley uh, Titians are, uh, you know, sort of living off of the free content and, you know, sort of the, the free data that ordinary people are sharing. Um, and then the people who are at the very bottom just don't exist, they're invisible. And so I wanted to use those same tools and those same forms to, um, you know, sort of ask people who were in, in that invisible space in our, in our society to uh, kind of like social media, people talking about what they eat, how they eat, what they do with their day, what their attitudes are towards politicians. I asked people, uh, you know, I spent a year interviewing people uh, and 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 make working with them to make vlogs, which then I used as an archive to to create uh, a 45 minute film, as opposed to the others, which were our installations and much shorter. So, yeah, wow, well, yeah. that was yeah. very intense to watch it. Yeah, it's an yes. in, it's it's a, it's an in, it's an intense yes. film to watch. I mean, it's not easy because we usually post or we show happiness or whatever we want other people to see but usually you hide this kind of like issues or problems or needs right so that's why yeah and also you know while poverty is discussed it's often not discussed by the people who actually have direct experience about it you know so people are not speaking you know they're not whining or complaining they're actually you know in a very dignified way talking about their experiences they're not used to you know having spotlights having people outside of their class coming in and saying, you know, sort of, you're, an ex you're actually the expert here. You know, what, what can you tell, you know, those who don't know about the day-to-day -day experience, you know, of living with no money in the United States? And, and these, are, these were people who are living in the Bay Area of San Francisco and also uh, Los Angeles, which are, you know, really rich cities, 
really rich cities, you know, one because of Hollywood and one because of Silicon Valley. Oh, well, you know, like I was very interested in that because I have some kind of research and I also work with vulnerable territories in Mexico and in the north of Mexico, which is like even more invisible for the rest of the country. We usually see works for vulnerable territories, but most from Mexico City. And then from the north of Mexico is like, well, there's no funding. There's like less people who want to see that. But I have also seen that there's a lot of creativity in these places. You know, they have to make themselves to have a life. Mm -hmm. And I was just telling someone the other day that it, there is also this like wish to dream. You know, like there's always, okay, so please dream. You can have a better life, but how? You know, like no one wants to see us. So it is always this struggle to have a better life. Right, yeah. right. And, and, you know, I mean, Hannah Arendt talks about the space of appearance, you know, as being visible in, a, in, you know, however one may be visible as a group of people, as, you know, sort of the first step in a political consciousness or, you know, the polis she talks about. And, you know, where she talks about the, you know, sort of the performative nature of people in Occupy, you know, sort of, not necessarily having a specific thing that they're protesting, but just being in public and making themselves and their concerns visible, you know? So, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Hiroshi, your work is also very related to collective memory, by the way. Yes, uh, mm -hmm. yes. So I'm, I'm gonna talk about this particular work, um, A Night of Elephants, and which I walk through sort of like a public and private sphere. Um, so I was given an assignment uh, to have a show uh, for the 66th anniversary of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima, and I'm from Hiroshima, I live here. Um, and initially, um, I mean, it's a big subject, um, and the context is very complex at the time. Um, you know, the, the survivors are dying, and, and then it was the midst of uh, Afghanistan war. This was 2005. So um, how do I talk about memory? Um, so initially, I came up with this, this idea or vision of um, elephant, uh, because the, in the West, elephants are known for memory. So I wanted to talk about the memory of atomic bombing in the shape of the elephant. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I tried to um, collect uh, objects from the time of the atomic bombing um, in Hiroshima. I posted an ad in the newspaper. But uh, this was uh, already uh, six year uh, past the atomic bombing. So most of the personal things um, um, were donated to the Peace Memorial Museum. So I found myself struggling to find things from the time of the bombing. So um, I was lost and, and I didn't know what to do. Uh, I only had one month to prepare. Um, then I was driving around and, and I happened to see a poster about the exhibition of the trees that survived the atomic bombing. And even though I'm from Hiroshima, I grew up until I was a teenager, I didn't know anything about the trees that were there. Um, because, you know, they don't speak to <laughs> us. <laughs> um, so I went to the exhibition, I met with the tree doctor who's been taking care of the, these uh, so-called hibaku trees. Uh, it's called, it's A-bomb trees uh, for 20 years. And he really liked my elephant idea of memory of Hiroshima. And then um, I asked him if he would collaborate. So, so um, we uh, went to the city hall and arranged. Um, there was one a day for pruning, you know, the trimming of the certain hibaku trees in Hiroshima. And he had um, made the schedule a little earlier so I could, uh, I could have it for the, for the exhibition. So basically I came with a truck, uh, uh, my parents' uh, company truck, <laughs> a large one, and I received a uh, full of um, leaves and branches of the, these three kinds of trees, uh, hackberry and kurogane mochi and plane trees, uh, all hibaku trees, the A-balm trees. And I dried them for two weeks and Meanwhile, I constructed this uh, metal um, cage-like structure in the shape of elephant lying down. 
and I stuffed the leaves and uh, trees inside, uh, and then I had an exhibition of lying elephant in the mi middle of the exhibition. Mm. And because um, Dr. Horiguchi, the tree doctor, was so kind in the process, um, I wanted to keep a relationship with him even after the exhibition. So I asked him initially, like, oh, can I have some souvenir for the students who came from New York to help my exhibition as a souvenir? Um, and he gave us the seeds uh, of the hibaku trees, these trees that survived the atomic bombing. Wow. And so some students, uh, some of my students, they grew them and, and I took pictures and posted uh, on a blog as a just kind of personal collection. Mm -hmm. And many people started seeing this and then they started to ask for seeds. Uh, people just contact me and say, I want to grow one too. So then uh, this um, so-called tree project has begun from there. Um, so in some ways, my work is like, I don't have a specific agenda for public or private discourse, but I just kind of walk through them uh, as I get inspired. So, Are the trees growing in New York? Yeah, I have one myself too, yeah. And they're yeah. actually took in their... Yes, they're, they're, they're just like any other regular trees. It's just they come from a trees that survived the atomic bombing, but they, they look like normal trees. And, and there, there's no scientific evidence that they've well, been Well, in the original trees, there are uh, like a, a annual rings. Um, after the A-bomb, like for three years, the annual rings got thicker because I think they grew faster to protect themselves and to heal themselves. And then after three years, the annual rings got to the normal um, width. So those are the, the, some of the scientific. I've sent mm -hmm. seeds to more than three to five hundred people, wow. but I think altogether I only have like hundred people who are responsive. You know, some people are like so enthusiastic in the beginning, and then you don't hear from them <laughs> after a while. You know, they I think their energy. What kind? Dies. What kind of climate does the does the tree grow in? Uh, it all depends because Hiroshima has four seasons, um, uh, hot and cold, so we have a variety. I uh, um, had a class uh, that in which I talked about the atomic bombing of Hiroshima as a possible consequence of current war at the time. Uh, and then I asked them to imagine what happens if, comes, if it comes to this far. So these are the students who I I brought to Hiroshima. Very nice. It must have been a very good project for them. Oh yeah, they had a good time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes. And you, do you want to talk about your... I was very fascinated with this work of yours um, that is like a telescope that you brought to also to Times Square. Let me tell you that. No, so that was that one is the globe. It began with a very simple question: um, Why cannot I see the stars in the city? Because I was born in the city and had lived in the city my whole lifetime. And I remember remember that I asked my father when I was a little, after reading some fairy tale about the stars or constellations, why I cannot see it? And he says just really simply, "Oh, it's maybe air pollution and." I kind of understood that way because in Korea, I was, I'm from Korea, so we were kind of developing country, so there are a lot of factories are kind of releasing a lot of fumes so that, oh, maybe someday, you know, when clean air, I can see that. But I never see it. And then um, the first time I see the tons of stars uh, was uh, at the remote island in Indonesia. So that it was a really small island and there was even no electric city uh, at night. They use a torch so that it was really dark. And then it also it was in the middle of the ocean so that I, I was able to see tons of stars there. I was so amazed by that. So after I came back, I, I came to New York and also on and off going to Seoul and I don't know, I think I wanted to make kind of 
star artificial star observatory for myself initially so that I create a um, globe uh, with a um, in the beginning it was a plaster but later on I develop into kind of assemblyable form by using a cardboard by using a polyhedron shape so that I can assemble piece by piece making a, a giant one eventually so that I, I poke the holes on the surface so that a viewer can put their head inside and look it feels like a looking at their um, stars although it's fake and then I don't know time scare I thought it's kind of obvious place kind of it's re represent light pollution obviously so that I thought for some reason that's the site I have to go with my globe so I took it to there I didn't th do anything weird I just tried whether it works and then but as you may know like time scale out there there are a lot of weirdos and a lot of performers so that people easily uh, um, take me as a kind of one of them and, then, <laughs> <laughs> and, and you're not <laughs> and then one thing happened was that um, I when I was a uh, trying using it and I, I heard a sound of you know banging so that wow because I was inside the sound was so uh, loud and then I, I took it off and look at it and I saw that one cop passing by me and just hitting you know wow. I thought I thought he's really <laughs> funny so that, that was his reaction wow. so, that, so did uh, anyone film you while you were there I don't know I, it, it I was mean, a, did you bring someone to yeah yeah I, I, someone to well, of course, because we saw the image. Yeah, yeah. I, saw, I, I asked someone to photo document it. Did they get the picture of the cop hitting the globe? Mm hmm They did? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so that, I don't know, but like many other works, um, my works, I feel strong kind of ambivalent emotions because uh, I was uh, one of the tourists who really enjoyed the Times Square when the, my, first day, my first day on visit to New York. I was so amazed by wow, giant light. I mean, billboards. So that I, I I usually try to visualize look at that kind of you know ambivalent feelings to the issue I'm interested in, not just simply shifting all the blame on some kind of um, cause or uh, causality um, relationship I found. So that, yeah, that's how I approach that work. Yeah. It's very nice. You know, I'm an architect also, so that's what I studied. And when I first came to New York, that was like the first thing I wanted to see, like all the buildings. I wanted to see all oh, this amazing architect. You know, I'm still amazed by Zaha Hadid's new building in Chelsea. So when I went to Times Square the first time, I was just like gone, you know? I was just looking at these beautiful buildings and you kind of forget of the stars. Or then you keep walking and if you go to Long Island or if you go upstate, then you find again these stars. So I was thinking that this was like a, a paradox actually, where you can see the stars and also all the buildings and also at Lincoln Center. If you go to ballet or to the opera uh, on Friday and Saturday night, you see these astronomers who take the telescopes and you can see the stars or Venus or whatever, so I thought it was very nice. Uh, do you also want to talk about your work where I cannot go? Oh, uh, yeah, so I think I, most of my work kind of deals with uh, how I view the world, so that like I used a you know, globe um, mask, giant mask, I used a telescope in this work and I one day I found a kind of list of country I'm not allowed to go as a Korean citizen and it's uh, kind of periodically updated on the website of Korean um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So it's very simple because of security reasons they kind of listed up the country uh, depending on the level of danger so that I, I was curious because I, I love traveling so like um, in, it was a 2011, I guess, and I looked it up. The oldest country was a top, you know, um, 
warning countries uh, uh, with uh, high security issues, uh, like um, Iraq or Libya at the time, because it was the uh, middle of the midst of the Arab Spring. So I looked it up to other countries, just Googling it, and then I, all the images that immediately pops up was a really tragic images, all the more, uh, images of terror or some kind of some people bleeding and imputated body. But I kind of wanted to approach that those uh, countries and images in a more personal way, more individual level. So that like I like we can see all the very touristic images of the city, like New York or Paris. I tried to look it up kind of the city, an image of the city in the Google, look something look really beautiful and something really attractive. And then I made a kind of postcard shape of it. And then as I had a chance to show this, that one in the you know, white cube space, I uh, installed um, on the wall way higher than usual eye level so that people can actually look at and can recognize uh, images, but to uh, fully understand what the uh, countries are, they have to use a binocular to see it. Yeah. That's very interesting. So the spectator has to go higher and then look at it, right? It is very interesting because at the end, like in all of your works, it's like the spectator is interacting with the pieces, right? In some, in some way. So it is a way to um, express yourself in a very personal way as a private experience, but also it's public because they have to interact.